Well, normally I would say welcome to Family Church, but instead today I want to say thank you for welcoming us to your home. We've always wanted to come to your home, and for you to invite us in like this is so special. I love what you've done with the blinds. They're beautiful. So uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Mark, and we're asking a fundamental question. Who do you follow? And as we've been in this sermon series, I've been making some observations. You know what I noticed? There's almost always in the story this moment where Jesus calls people to do something, and what you will see is what reflects whether or not they are a follower depends entirely, entirely on how they respond to him. What I'd like you to do is today as we look at a story, I want you to make sure that your heartbeat and your mind is following along to say, what is their response? One of my uh, favorite aspects of, um, of uh, being a follower of Jesus is anytime you hear people talking about things that Jesus has said, and they don't know that it's Jesus that said them, for instance, you remember when you're in elementary school and they tell you about the golden rule? Yeah, that was Jesus. You see it on a little poster. Now, that wasn't some poster maker. That was Jesus. And one of them is that uh, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. A lot of people don't know that actually comes from Jesus. And today we're going to talk about treasure. Um, as most of us throughout the last few weeks have lost a lot of treasure, we thought, why not bring up the idea of treasure? In fact, I have some treasure here on stage, and um, as I bring this out, I realize for some of you, it's going to do some things to you emotionally. I need you to stay calm. Uh, some of you will have an adrenaline rush because it reminds you of something over the last four or five weeks. So I have with me right here um, some treasure that for some reason over the last six weeks has become something that people fight over in a store. And, and I was actually looking at the value of toilet paper in comparison with gold. Gold is actually selling at $1,675 per ounce. Uh, toilet paper just behind. It's a little bit less, but one ounce of toilet paper is approximately $1,500 worth. And why is it that we have this? Because we start asking questions in crisis. How much toilet paper does it take to fend off a deadly virus? <laughs> My favorite part of this whole thing, too, is if you talk to anyone about toilet paper during it, no one was ever crazed enough to go get it. Everyone who was buying it, you know what they said? We actually needed it. Sure. No, I mean, we were actually low. I've got $4 in my home. Or so. You always hear something like that. We needed the toilet paper. I'm just going to leave this right here. I'm going to trust that you'll keep your hearts calm and be able to follow along and not just covet this, okay? So focus with me. But one of the things I want you to notice is that when crisis comes, we actually do this a lot. We start asking questions. Some of them are actually kind of funny. Some of them you'll find aren't funny at all. They're actually really serious because one of the things that happens when crisis comes is we'll start having questions that are fear-based. We start saying, what if? What if the economy keeps going this way? What if I lose my job? What if I get it? What if my parents get it? What if? And we're essentially asking, is, is God in control? And not only do we ask what if, we also ask why. We're also asking how. You see, fear can move around in us and it can start to cycle inside of our hearts and cycle inside of, inside of our thinking. But sometimes there's also questions that come when there's crisis that has to do a lot more with how can I help you start seeing neighbors that you never noticed before. You start seeing people in need and you start saying, how can I step in? We start asking questions like, what do you need? Is there anything I can do for you? One of the things that I hope, though, is more than anything, when crisis comes, we start asking deeper questions than, than fear questions and even deeper and more important questions than things like, how can I help? I hope we ask questions like, what really matters? Because when crisis comes, this gives us an opportunity. If we take it, it gives us the opportunity to realign our eyes and say what really matters. Because I'll tell you, if you've been worshiping sports for your life, it's gone. And if you've been worshiping money, 40% of it's gone. And that's just a reality. So what do you have left? Well, hopefully what's left is what really matters. So I want to talk through some of that. And we're going to look at a story today in the book of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 10, if you could turn there with me. I know that you guys, some of you are getting extreme cabin fever, and so I'm going to have you do something with me. I want you to be transported from your couch and your home, outside of your home, and I want you to land 2,000 years ago in Israel in a small, insignificant country. 
And I want you to watch an interaction between two important people. One of them was important in, the day, in his day and age, and the other person was Jesus Christ, who was important for all eternity. And there's an interaction here, but what I want you to do is I want you to be so in this that you have dust on your feet, that you can smell the city, that you're, that you're engrossed in this. So as we're there, I want you to notice that there's an important question that's asked. And I don't believe that the person asking the question actually comes from crisis, but I'll tell you what, even without crisis, he asks the right question. And that might be one of the most pertinent questions that we can answer here in our lives today in the middle of this very difficult time. So come with me 2,000 years ago into a dusty story. Here's we're going to pick it up. And Jesus started on his way, and a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. He says, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So picture this. Jesus is on his way, and up comes a guy running. Now, in our minds, a lot of us run even for leisure. In that day and age, when someone ran, he was lacking all decorum. People of dignity did not run. You would never see someone like Pastor Paul or Pastor Ed run in those days. But this young man runs to Jesus and then in an act of submission gets on his knees before him and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the next verse is so interesting. Jesus' response is to ignore this fundamental question and he actually asks a, or answers something different, interacts with him on the first part when he says, good teacher, Jesus comments on that. And I want you to stop and think for a second. The word good. As soon as I say, think of something good, all of you have thought of something good. So here's what I want you to do. In your homes, one word answers, okay? Everyone in your home and in your room, all of you very quickly share the first thing that comes to mind when I say, good, go. So... Here's what's interesting. I could tell some of you are still talking, so I need you to go ahead and stop because I know how you are. This is family church, and I get that once I say, say something, you're just blah, 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 and we're done. Okay, and here's what's interesting. Some of you are like, we're at church, and so you say Jesus because it's on the screen. You're like, good teacher. It's Jesus is good. And others of you were a little bit more real. You said stuff like chocolate, and you said hamburgers and blizzards, and you said, it's amazing. In the room I'm in, the amount of people that said something that had to do with food. You can tell we're Americans here. Raise your hand if you said something that had to do with food. Very good. Raise your hand if you had something to do with Jesus. Okay, you get church points. Good job. Here's what I want you to see about this, though. When we see the word good, it means everything from uh, something we eat all the way up to God in heaven. That is not the way the Greek language worked. In fact, if you look at the New Testament, this word for good in the Greek actually only appears twice. And guess what it describes? It only describes God. So here's this interesting interaction. This guy runs up, kneels down, calls Jesus good teacher, and then asks the most important question in all eternity, in all of life. And Jesus pauses before he answers the question, and he says, listen carefully, you just called me good. And then he says this, why do you call me good? Only God is good. It's just a little aside in the story, but it's so important because he said, yeah, you just made a comment about me? Let's just pause for a second and rest on that. Yeah, that's true. Only God is good. And I think this is a moment, and I'm inferring here a little bit, but I think Jesus is pausing to point out his own divinity. And then he goes on with the question. Uh, and, and Jesus says to him in verse 19, You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. And the response of the guy says, done, nailed it. All these I have done. Which is funny. Essentially, he's saying, got it all together. <laughs> right. Now, Jesus doesn't respond to that because, real quickly, raise your hand if you've lived your life without sin. Okay, good. Thank you for, if you raised your hand, um, your parents will talk to you about that in a little bit because all of us have sinned. No one lives up to all of these. Just let's stop. And just, I just noticed this. Honor your father and mother. How many of you made it to 18 doing that? Okay, I see you roll your eyes right now. Exactly my point. Jesus doesn't he actually comment on this. He, he lets it go. The guy says, 
yeah, nailed it. And Jesus goes on, so he goes like this. Jesus looked at him, and then there's this emotion, there's this connectivity that's away from just the facts of the story. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then he said this, there's one thing that you lack. He said, go and sell everything that you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then, come follow me. Now remember, the essence of our, our sermon series is, who do you follow? And we're asking, well, what's the response of people? Jesus lays it out. Here's what you're going to do. To follow me, first sell everything, and then come with me. This right here, is this the 13th disciple? Is this the guy that's going to come in and be a part of it? And here's what we see. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad. And you just look, at, look at this. Jesus loves him, invites him in, but the guy walks away from an interaction with Jesus, and he doesn't follow. And then it says why? Because he had great wealth. A sad story. It's funny, too, that you'll notice, too, it says sad, but also there's a little part here I hadn't noticed until I'm standing right here. It says, he went away. It's not just the emotion of it, but he missed everything. And then Jesus responds, and then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the, the disciples say, well, well, who can get in then? How, how does this even happen? What do we do? And Jesus says, you know, it's impossible with man, but with God all things are possible. There's a few things about both this question and this interaction and the choice that's made that I like to draw out today. So um, if you guys can have your, your, your outlines ready, I know that you can do that on the app or maybe you've printed out your outline ahead of time. Um, if you just have some paper and you want to jot some things down, that works too. But there's some things that I noticed in this that I'd really like to draw our attention to. And whenever we look at a narrative story that Jesus has, what we can see in it is there is a, a way that he responds they can make us look at our own lives and challenge ourselves to say, do I line up in the same way he's calling someone to? How does that affect me? And do I respond as Jesus called this guy to? So the first thing that I want you to notice in this is the question. The question. The most important question. The young man runs up. You know, it's funny. We don't know a lot about this guy. We don't know his name. But here's what we do know. We know that he was young. We know that he was rich. We know that he had some authority because it says that he was um, a wealthy young man. We also, or authority that um, he was also called a ruler. We know that he's religious because of how he answered. We know very little about him. We don't even know how his story ends. We know that he walked away in this one. But he comes with the right question and he asks, that, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And as he asks this question, I want you to notice a couple of things about Jesus' response. The first thing that Jesus says, he, he really gives two responses. The first one is to raise the level of right and wrong. And he lists the commandments. And the guy actually says, oh, I've done all that. I don't know how you felt, but when, the, when it says, honor your father and mother, he's like, nailed it. And I'm like, well, let me talk to your mama. All right, because, yeah, you saying that, mm-hmm, yeah, I don't know about that. But Jesus doesn't even comment on the fact that this guy's probably lying right now. Honor your father and mother. Do not commit adultery, coveting. Just the, the list that do not defraud. The list there. But instead of trying to nail him on that one, Jesus goes to a deeper level. So he talks about holiness, but then he leans into heart. And he says, then one thing you lack. There's just one more thing. Sell, all, sell it all. Give it to the poor. And then come follow me. Jesus gives two parts of the story. One of them is about holiness. The second one is about the heart, the heart of surrender. And I, I'd like you to notice something here, that the story we're talking about, when it comes to an eternal life, eternal connection with God the Father, he's, he's telling this, this interaction is happening before Jesus has died and risen from the dead three days later, it, that, which means that the explanation is going to be slightly different now because we're living on this side of the resurrection. And I'd actually like to walk through with you what it means to answer this question. Because very clearly in Romans, we find what it takes to become a follower of God. The first, and we just do it real simply um, in three simple steps. It just goes A, B, C. A is to admit you're a sinner. 
This has to do with that aspect of holiness that, that Jesus talked about. The commandments matter. Right and wrong matter. And when you fail, you have to be able to say, that's me. So let's flip the question I asked earlier and ask you this. Raise your hand if you've ever done something that you knew was wrong and sinful. Okay, so let's just start there. What I found in my lifetime of sharing the ABCs of being a follower of Jesus, not once has someone said, nah, that ain't me. Everyone's willing to say, yeah, I've sinned. I don't care how low your standards are. You can put your, your standards at the bottom and you will fail them. And God's standards are perfection. So the first thing that you have to know is that you have to admit that you're a sinner. Because your relationship with Jesus, or the relationship with God, he's perfect. And you've got to be perfect too. And here's what we just, we come to with the A. We admit we can't do it. Let's go to the B. A, B. The B stands for believe. Believe, quite simply, means that you understand who Jesus is and that you agree with the facts of who he said he is. He said he is God. So he, we have to believe that he really lived a perfect life without sin. Because this is what's going to cover our sin. He, we believe he lived a perfect life. We believe he really died. Then three days later, he really rose again, conquering sin and death. Interestingly enough, a lot of people will get to this place. In fact, demons themselves admit that they're sinners. Demons believe, they know, Satan knows that Jesus really lived, really died, and really rose again and was perfect. Satan's in on that. But he hasn't gone to step three, okay? Because the last one, the C, is really what Jesus challenges him on. Because this goes to the heart. This goes to surrender. Because the C is that we would commit our lives to Jesus. You're in charge. Interesting thing about this, if, if you think all the way through this, he says to him a, a, a challenge that says, your heart is about money, so I'm going to challenge you where it matters to you. There are some people that uh, they're like Forrest Gump. They have no idea anything about money. They just don't care about money. It's not really on their focus. If you remember on the, the movie Forrest Gump, there comes that point when he gets a letter that says that they've invested in Apple and they don't have to worry about money anymore. And he says, well, that's good. One last thing. The rich young ruler was not like that. The rich young ruler, on the other hand, his heartbeat was about money. And Jesus says, yeah, you're going to have to deal with that. And I don't know what your heartbeat issue is, but that's going to be something that God's going to call you to have to deal with. The second thing that I noticed that there's not just a question that's asked, there's also an interaction with Jesus that I think is so amazing. You see, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And what I find so fascinating about this is he does this before the challenge comes. Looking at, and Jesus looking at him loved him. Before the, the challenge comes, he has said, holiness matters. The guy says, I nailed it. And then Jesus looks at him and loves him. And I was thinking, so often when we think of unconditional love, we think of it in terms of, you've messed up, and I will choose to love anyway. But I think there was another side of the mountain if you can look at it from another side, what happens when we choose love unconditionally before we know anything that person has done? I'm willing to commit to love before I know whether or not they're going to hurt me or follow. As I was thinking about this, I was, I was curious, is there any time in our lives where we actually do this, where we choose love before we know how people are going to treat us? And, and I think there's a good example. I want you to pause for a second and just in your own mind, think to yourself, is there an area in your life where you have lived loving unconditionally before someone has done right or wrong? As I thought about it, I, I, I realized there's a place where I think that this happens. And for many of you, you will resonate with this. This is, this is maybe something where you will connect with how Jesus connected with the rich young ruler. You'll connect with this. And I think it's, it looks a little bit like this. It looks a little bit like a mama and a baby. You see, uh, Crystal carried little Anna, for nine months, and then went through 30 hours of labor. And when she held that baby for the first time, that baby didn't even say thank you. <laughs> and that mama, your mama, didn't know how you were going to turn out. Whether or not you'd ever learn calculus, or whether or not you'd even ever learn to walk, or whether or not you would be respectful, any of that, but when a mama holds her baby, 
There is an unconditional love that precedes any of the actions, and I see that in Jesus. He, looking at him, he loved him. And I want you to know this. This echoes the heartbeat of who Jesus is. When they say that, it honestly kind of feels trite. God is love. Man, here's, here's it born out in the flesh. But I want you to see another part of this, that there's something else that has to happen. And it's true within the relationship that you have with Jesus. It's true in the relationship your kids will have with Jesus. And it's been true for the 2,000 years since Jesus rose from the dead. Is that with each of us, there will be a choice. You know, part of that love thing that, uh, that Jesus said is he gave him the truth. And the truth was your heart's about money. And your heart can't be about money and about me. So you're going to have to pick between the two. And he gives them the choice, and it, it bears out this way, I'm going back to the text, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He went away sad because he's making a choice. He's picking right there. He's making a, de- a decision. What will I do? Review. Admit you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus really lived really died and really rose again. And then the final one, C, commit. But he went away sad. Because when given the choice, he chose the lesser. I never thought of this before, but I just realized what a sad story this is. Story of a man who interacted with Jesus and went away the way he came. I don't know that there's anything sadder in the world than having the opportunity to meet with Jesus and go the other way. As I bear this out, I've stopped to think for a second. For each of us, this choice idea may mean a number of different things because as I said, you might have the Forrest Gump view of money and you don't care about it and you're like, following Jesus is easy. It may be something very different for you. But let me just play that question out. What is the choice that God is having you answer right now? What is the thing that is the challenge that that, that when given the choice between Jesus and fill in the blank of something else, what is it that is pulling you in some other direction? Even just put it in with this. What if Jesus called you to do what he did? If he called you to sell your house, and I'm not saying that he is. I don't think that what we see in this text is a prerequisite to become a follower of Jesus. But what if he did ask you personally, to sell your home, or to quit your job, or to give your money, or to give away your retirement. What, what's your response to that? I'd like to share something with you that, um, because this is such a treasure question, that this, that this text really deals with money, I want to talk with you about something that's not from the Bible, but it can really help you see what may be going on in your heart. And it asks just a simple question, what does money mean to you? And my answers here, I I can find nowhere in the Bible, but I I have three of them. There's probably a million. For some people, it means power, and for others, it's status. But I see three things that this this really relates to uh, that, that was helpful for me. One of them is that it means safety. If I have money, if something goes wrong, I'll be able to use that money to fix what's wrong. It keeps me safe. So if I have eight months' worth of savings, I will be fine. Why? Because if I lose my job, everything will be you, I mean, you get the, the principle there. The second one is that it has, that just gives us freedom. That if I have money, I can do what I want to do. I can buy as much overpriced coffee as I want, which I'm so happy to see that coffee shops are essential, and somehow they stay open. But it, you can still spend $6 on a coffee if you so choose. But it's just a freedom. I like coffee. I like shopping. I like filling up my travel. Whatever you like, when you have money, you have freedom to do it. But there's a third one that I want to talk about today. And this is the one that's critical that in your heart would override the other two. And that's a heartbeat of generosity. You see, in generosity, the thinking is that there's something that I have and there's something that someone else needs. And will what I have matter more to me? Will I hold it so tightly that I can't release it and say, God, what I have is yours. I'm simply doing what you've called me to do with it. Because this idea of where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Whenever it's these two, or status, or power, or something, 
it'll be in challenge with you and Christ. Whenever it's in generosity, it is what God was calling the rich young ruler to. I'd like to actually uh, have some people come up and, and share part of their story. Uh, this is Ross and Trevana. Um, you may call them Ross and Trevana. I personally call them mom and dad. So this is my mother and this is my father. And uh, they've been through... Um, throughout their life, a number of times where these things came into conflict, where generosity and safety and freedom were in conflict. So um, one of those times was in 2008, what was going on in your life? About a year and a half earlier, we had started our own business. Uh, we owned a design studio, so I sold cabinets, got to design kitchens all day. Let's just say in 2008, it was not fun being in construction. Because the economy had crashed. Just a re reminder for those of you younger, you will know this, but uh, in 2008, the economy crashed, which meant a lot of people stopped buying things like new kitchens. And so there you were at a time where money probably meant a safety issue. Yeah, there were times we weren't sure we could pay the rent. Um, that month, I think it was September, I had 13 kitchens ready, big kitchens, $20,000 kitchens, ready to sign off and every last one of them vanished. So in that process, you're wondering, how are you going to make it? Well, how do you not make this where you start choosing money over Jesus? How do you say, uh, we're going to have generosity override safety? A lifetime of being taught to give, being taught to tithe, and about a year and a half, well, before we started the business, we were confronted with a need in our church, a remodeling project. Yeah. And so this we, would be something similar to the, like, the REACH campaign? Yes, that we're, yes, very similar. We were at a prayer meeting trying to determine how to fund this. And my mind kept wandering off because we'd been talking about starting the business and it kept wandering off well the third time it wandered off and i said lord i'm supposed to be praying about this god gave me a number a pretty big number and that number was something that you were thinking that you would be giving we to? would yeah we would be giving to this uh fund rate to the remodel of the church okay well, in this living room where we were praying, it was very crowded. I was sitting on the floor leaning against his knees. And when he said, God gave me a number, I tensed up because I knew my husband's heart. And just like that, I said, oh, dear Heavenly Father, I know my husband's heart. And just like that, I had a number in my mind. So let's just, just clarify here. So in the time that you have known him and been married to him, how many years have you guys been married? Uh, 49. So 49 years, his idea of giving is really, really high, and yours is not as much. Because I have an issue with safety, mm -hmm. and that's where Satan attacks me. So usually, mine's here, Ross's is here, and we split it in the middle. <laughs> split the difference. Yeah. Well, this time it wasn't. And so let's just say the number was such that I was glad I was sitting down. And I took my bulletin out of the Bible, wrote the number down, held it over my shoulder and said, is this it? He nodded. So you both had the same number prior to the crash. So at a time when your heart problem would have been coming up, just screaming at you daily, you had this thing that God had spoken to each of your hearts that you were called to give. Well, and part of the number was that God was saying to us, start the business. You're going to accomplish this through starting a business. Mm. So um, you made it. You did not starve. The business did well. In fact, I know the next part of the story, almost exactly 10 years later, I didn't just realize this, that it sold almost exactly to the month. 10 years later, in 2018, the business sells. How'd it go? It sold for far more than any of the pundits, the people we knew in the industry thought that we would be able to sell it. So suddenly, and I, and, um, I understand this from your story, for the first time in your life, safety no longer seemed to be an issue. <laughs> freedom was now an option. Yes. yes. Yes, we got to experience freedom like we had never in our life uh, after buying a house, remodeling it. Uh, of course, we're frugal, so we did all the labor ourselves just about, we got to go on our dream cruise 
get off the cruise ship, and the day we got so, off the so cruise So what I'm hearing you're saying is you now have freedom to do this. Yes, we went on our dream cruise. So how off. do you make sure that generosity still overrides this new idea of freedom? What, what goes on in your heart to, to make sure that happens? Tell we, <laughs> yeah, we uh, stepped off the cruise ship, went for a walk, and got hit by a car. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's really not I don't it. know that that's really what, I, what we're saying to you, that as Jesus calls your heart, he's going to have you hit by a car. If you don't, give generously. But I would say, what I'm hearing you saying is that generosity was still a part of this. Can you tell that part of the story, too? Generosity has been a part from childhood. Well, but but tell I, how it happened in this part when, it, you're, when the freedom temptation was now part of your life. Well, as the Christmas offering started coming oh. and we uh, started praying about it, you know, what would God have us give? Then once again, and this hasn't happened very often, we came up with the same number. So uh, we are so glad we gave that to the Christmas offering because that was part of our retirement. But otherwise, that money would have been gone, long gone, with what the stock market is doing now. Instead, that money will count for eternity. That's right. So I, I want you to hear that, just the, the realization. Right now, the stock market is down, down a lot. So people yeah. that are living off their retirement, they're looking at that saying, oh, no. Listen to the, the, the beauty of this, that three or four months ago, they had the opportunity to give, and when they gave, they realized that they gave before the crisis, which meant it, it went for eternity and now that the economy has crashed, all of that money that they gave uh, would be gone. Well, I so appreciate you guys being willing to share your story. Um, it's a beautiful story, and I hope it's a challenge for all of us that whether or not you're living with safety in a relationship to money or freedom, that generosity and car accidents can override the yes. two things. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. Well, I have a couple challenges for you, some things that I want you uh, to be processing in your own heart. One of them is this idea of what has your heart. Now, when the rich young ruler got there, Jesus spoke directly to the issues within him. What's going on inside of you may be different than what's going on inside the rich young ruler because it was money. For some of you, it's your time. For some of you, it's your status. For some of you, it's your position. But I'd like to ask you, what has your heart? And that's going to come to our second topic. We want to challenge you with the idea of giving. Because it may be time that you need to give, and it may be money that you really, you have never trusted God with your money. And this story actually convicts your heart because at a time when it seems like money is scarce, he's actually leaning on you and you're feeling that tight tension in your chest because you know he's speaking directly to you. But maybe it is time to give financially. Another um, need in the community, um, we're hearing about this, Family Church um, at, at our campuses, we've been over the last year really, really connected to the Red Cross. Um, we do blood drives every two or three months, we, and we pack them out. Um, we love partnering with them. Well, we can't do blood drives in communal places anymore, um, but th there is a huge need for blood, and if you would be willing to go to the Red Cross, it's right there on Garden Valley, would you please make an appointment and give in that way? Um, I know that you're going to have to be creative with the way you're going to give your time. Maybe you're going to sit down every, every night and you're going to write a thank you card or a card to someone and say that we're praying for you and we're encouraging, but in some way, give of your time. And for some of you, I know we're getting this question a lot. Uh, at Family Church, we don't take an offering. We let you give an offering. Uh, so the way that that happens is in all of our lobbies, there's a place to give, and you can't get into the lobbies. And so people are asking, how do I continue to give? And so I want to make sure that you understand. It, for those on the tech side, there's two ways you can give on the website or on the church app. Uh, but for those of you who don't use technology, I would love it if, if you can go ahead, if you are, are looking to still give, you can just mail that to either, any one of our campuses, and it will still find its way into the bank account. Uh, so th that's a component that we'd love for you to, to know about. There's two questions, though. What has your heart? We've got to evaluate this. And I guarantee this. In some way in your life, God is calling you to give. Let me pray for us. Lord, I was just thinking as we were... As I was listening to my parents talk about, I was thinking about Hebrews 11, talking about all these people who their stories point to the goodness of you. 
Abraham and Sarah and Moses and David and Noah. And at the beginning of chapter 12, it says, um, let us uh, fix our eyes on Jesus because we have remembered all of these people. Therefore, since we've been surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's focus on, on who Jesus is. And I was thinking about, I, I'm so grateful for stories of people who have trusted you and how they can inspire us. Stories of Jesus and stories from the Bible and stories from those people who have gone before us. Lord, I pray that we would be living out a story that someday our kids would say, oh, I remember how God provided for my parents. I remember them telling me the story of how God moved and provided for them in the middle of the corona crisis. I remember them talking about how their faith grew because in the middle of tragedy and crisis, God showed himself faithful and they trusted more than they ever had before. God, I pray that you would raise that up in us as individuals, in us as a church, in us as a life groups, in us as a country, God, I pray that you would draw us to you. I'm so grateful for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we are so glad that you uh, spent this morning with us. Or for some of you, you're watching this a little bit later. Thank you for waking up and watching this with us. A couple things that we want to make sure that you are aware of. I know it's interesting. How, what do we announce since the main events are gone? So we're going to help you stay connected. And the first thing I want you to see is if you go to our website, there's a, a new tab that says FC Now. This will tell you what's going on. Any information, any updates, what's happening uh, around the county, this is the best place to go. It's right in the middle. It says FC Now. Uh, for those of you who are 6th grade through 12th grade, I know you were wondering what are we doing for student ministries since we can't all get together and throw projectiles at each other's faces like we would normally would in student ministries. How are we interacting? And uh, we have a, a live student ministry that's coming out every single Sunday night where there will be a teaching and connective time where you can do that online with our, um, t our regular teaching team from student ministries. Um, also, if you would like to contact us, you can email us at info at familychurchweb.com. We want to hear from you. If you have a prayer request, if you have a question, you email there and we will get back to you. What you are doing, what you're going through, and the information that you need matters and we want to be a part of that. And then uh, two more things that we'd like for you uh, to, to know about is um, every day at noon, Monday through Friday, we are doing a Facebook Live and this has a wide-ranging number of topics that we're dealing with. On Fridays, it's about uh, kids and how to uh, connect with them. Uh, we're also talking about just devotional things. We're helping you know how to do things. But every day at noon, we are trying to connect with you. So you can do that um, every day at noon on Facebook. And then if you could also connect with us on the online connect card, that would be great. And then I will try and keep my microphone on, which is always a difficult thing. And then finally, if you could like our main page on Instagram and Facebook, that would be very, very helpful. It keeps other people connected to it as well. Another thing you might want to consider doing is when you're in the middle of the sermon is making sure other people know that it's happening because there are people that are looking for answers right now. And I'm going to tell you something. With Jesus Christ on our side, we can point people to him and we can give them the right answer for the real question of what really matters. I love you guys and I miss you. I am hugging you from afar. Have a good day. Love you.